special and is going to be special. So here we are, 15 years later. He's no longer with us. As I sat in my office moments ago pondering what to say, it occurred to me, say what the Steve McNair. This is when he got inducted into the Mississippi Hall of Fame. When you walk into Lucille McNair's memory room, it's hard not to be overwhelmed with the accomplishments of her sons, especially the one known as Steve Air McNair, a legacy she says began when Steve was a young boy following in the footsteps of his older brother, Fred. I always tell the young children, I say, I'm not bragging on him, but you can do what Steve McNair did. Just stay focused. And, and move on up. Lucille was a single mom, raising five rambunctious boys. Steve, Jason, Tim, Michael. A close-knit family, the McNairs never had a lot, but Lucille says they had each other. They appreciated what, you know, what they had. And so they never complained about other children having this. And they couldn't, they didn't have that. They never complained. But she worked nights and had no idea that her sons, against her wishes, were making a name for themselves on the football field. They were slipping playing football <laughs> on the PBT. And then in junior high, they started doing And I said, something is not right about this. Oldest son, Fred McNair, was the first star to emerge. In fact, he was the first to wear the number nine jersey that his younger brother would eventually make famous. If you put them out there, you know, to throw passes, it's just, they look the same. But Fred will, more, Fred will pick you apart just standing in the pocket. But Steve, his feet was, he just moved. But Lucille was more concerned with them moving in the classroom. Everyone went to college. I bought them a Bible and I told them, God come first, the boots come second, and the sports come next. I bought them a Bible and I told them, God come first, the boots come second, and the sports come next. Young Cam Newton was there. Troy Smith, Heisman Trophy winner. Vince Young. Oh, oh, come on. Put it up in there. All I 
This is our football camp, but you know, we also teach them, you know, the, the things about life and what they expect out of life. is kind of special, but I never, I had it in my mind, but I didn't tell nobody that was me and God. But soon, everyone knew, Steve turned down an opportunity out of high school to be drafted into baseball. He said, Mama, he said, we, we need the money. I said, look, your education is more important. I said, we struggling now. I said, we're not going to be, I'll always be down. Right. And I said, what you ain't got, you can't miss it. So instead, he headed to Alcorn State University, following his brothers, Fred and Tim. And on the gridiron, he was magic. Look at me, Spinning. Nobody's going to catch him. When they were saying, hand them the Heisman, I said, what is the Heisman? I told them, I said, I don't know. And they were saying, talking about, you know, they were giving me different people named that won the Heisman. The 1994 recipient. He didn't win the Heisman, but was taken third in the NFL draft, heading to Houston to become an oiler and eventually a Tennessee Titan. Called a warrior on the field, McNair often played through bruises, concussions, and other fairly serious injuries. He said, but they need me. And he said, and I, he said, I'm not going to let them down. And so he was... He would sacrifice his body, you know, to try to help his team and his teammate. So why don't you come back five steps? And that's not all. Generous to a fault, Lucille says Steve gave freely of his time, his talents, and his money. He said, they ain't got nothing. He said, I know how it is when you ain't got nothing. He said, and I never believed that I was going to be in this position to help other people. But he was, and he did. Lucille says people will never know how kind and gentle her son was, but she says his legacy now lives on through his four sons and his family. She offers this advice to other young athletes who aspire to be warriors on the field like Steve McNair. He pays the way. I said, so it's time for y'all to, you know, to move forward. It's been a long road. 13 years from Houston to Memphis to Nashville and now in Baltimore. It's been a long road. But... You know, I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate to surround myself with great people, great coaches, great teammates, you know, great family. And when you have that support, you know, you can almost overcome everything in life. And then when everywhere I go, it's, it's like a family. You know, uh, my career, you know, speaks for itself. Um, I enjoyed it. I can look back on it, reflect back on it. You know, and, and I wouldn't change a thing. The way I play the game, the way I approach the game, the love I have for the game, I wouldn't change that. I played the game with a lot of passion. I played the game with a lot of heart. And it showed over the course of my 13 years. Over 13 years, I had a lot of injuries because I played the game physical, because I gave it 110% every game. Because if we was up by 30 or if we was down by 30, there was always that opportunity that I feel like, you know, me and my teammates and the coaching staff and organization can make things happen. It's always, I always believe, regardless of what situation we was in. Over the course of my career, it's been, it's been ups and downs, in which I learned from the good and I learned from the bad. But coming out making this decision, it was a very difficult decision. It was hard. 
you know, when you, when you, especially when you're walking away from the game and, you know, you, in your mind, you feel like you can play. You still can compete. But when you're fighting that battle, you know, from your mind to your body, that those two is not on the same accord, it's not going to work in the National Football League. You know, your mind and your body got to be on the same page. My mind was there. Mentally, I could go out and play. But physically, I just couldn't do it anymore. Not to the capacity that I need for, to help my teammates win a football game. That's one reason the decision, it was a hard decision, but I think it's a good decision. Because I'm always a team player first. To come back and just relax, I'm enjoying it. I come out here and play around on the tractors, four-wheelers, horses, and, and do a lot of stuff that I did when I was a kid. I get away from uh, the city, from football. Home. Take care. You put your shoes on yet, huh? You gotta take care of that. This farm is about 643 acres, probably about 200 in pine trees, and the rest of it in grazeland for my animals. What's going on? I see, they've been feeding you pretty good. Show me what you got. Oh, looking pretty good. Looking pretty good. Right now, we got some hay to be moved and put in uh, rows so guys like this can stay healthy. a lot of things that you have to do on a ranch. We come out every morning, feed the cows, and, and watch them graze a little bit. When they see a bag of feed, they'll uh, run to you. Come on, don't y'all be back for the day. Woo! Woo! They still don't for us a little bit. Woo! They get up slowly, but they coming. Yeah, that's a good sight there. I like that. I have about 150 heads of cattle right now. All of them pregnant and about to drop any time now. That's the bull, eh? That's the man. You know, you gotta treat those guys just like you treat humans, so, and then we try to respect that. It all started when police pulled over the Cadillac Escalade on Broadway for going 54 to 30 mile per hour zone. So Hell Cosme was driving with Steve McNair in the passenger seat. After Officer Sean Taylor approached the SUV, Steve McNair asked if Officer Taylor remembered him. Because five years earlier, Taylor pulled over McNair for DUI, but a judge threw out the case. This time, Officer Taylor went back to his patrol car and called a fellow officer, seemingly surprised by who was in the car. Yes, it's with her. Taylor then puts Kazumi through field sobriety tests and determines she is impaired. Later, police allow McNair and someone else to get out of the SUV and take a taxi. In the back of the patrol car, Kazumi asks for McNair to come over. He has already gone. Kazumi later calls another friend to come and get the SUV. She then calls McNair and asks that he get her out of jail. She spent about four hours in jail. Police say McNair did bond her out. They say later that same day, Kazumi bought the gun used in the murder. Ben Hall, News Channel 5, investigates. Police did not charge McNair because he and Kazumi owned the vehicle together. Now, if McNair had solely owned the vehicle, he could have faced charges for allowing an impaired person to drive. Oh, my God. Hello? 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 Yeah, what's going on, man? It's 911. Oh, my God. Sorry, what's going on? Hello? 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 
what street are you on? All right, what's your name? My name is Rob. Rob, what's going on? Yeah, okay, Rob. Second and Lee don't cross. Where, where are you at? At this um, at a condo. Okay. Do you know what the address is? What? Hey, man, I'm trying to answer this guy right here. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Rob, tell me what's going on. I got it. Where are you at? Rob. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. Somebody's been shot. I I, I, I haven't checked the vitals, but he's black. Okay, all right, bear with me. I'm going to help you out here. Where exactly are you at second and Lee? Bob. Yeah. Okay, boss, talk to me so I can try to help you here, okay? Give me some info. Where are you? I'm I'm, I'm trying to find exactly where I'm at, sir. I'm walking out into the curb. Okay. Is Is the person breathing? I don't, I don't look like it. Okay. Between, between Rutledge, the, uh, the, the, the condos are between the Rutledge and Second Avenue. Okay. And the sign right here says Carl, Carl, Carl Wheel Place. 105 Lee Avenue. Okay. All right, I got help on the way. Now tell me what's going on. I don't want I'm, I'm, I'm not doing, do I need to walk back inside? That's up to you, don't leave it up there. Right. There's two, there's two bullet wounds, two gunshots, down the wall. Okay. All right, now do you, do you know who this is? I mean, or tell, tell me, tell me how you found this. Okay, what apartment is it? This apartment. Go on. You don't have to go back in there if you don't want to, but I mean, you know. Apartment 4, sir. Okay. All right. Is there, is there a name to those apartments? Is there, is there what? Is there a name to the apartment? No, not that I know of. Okay. And you ask you what the address is? No, sir. Okay. I mean, I hate that. I, I, I can't be the one to make this call. It's so so messed up. Okay. All right, Rob. I got, I got some help coming to you. Now, tell me what happened. I have no idea, sir. Okay, but I mean, how did you... Yeah, I, 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 I received a phone call. Uh-huh. And, uh, and uh, okay. I was in the party inside this apartment. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, Uh-huh. Okay, and he's the roommate? Uh, yeah. 
Police sources that former Tennessee Titan Steve McNair has passed away. That's right. At about 1:46 this afternoon, at first the call came in as a double homicide. A man had been shot in the head. There's also a female victim as well. But again, former Tennessee Titan Steve McNair has died in an apparent shooting. We're still working out the details. Police say the former Baltimore Raven Steve McNair was shot to death. He was found inside an apartment in Nashville, Tennessee. Let's get right down to Fox 5's Dave Ross for the latest developments. Dave, what do we know about this? Uh, Tom, this is a stunner in the sports world, especially when it involves a former NFL MVP. Steve McNair was a rare breed, a trendsetter of sorts for today's current signal callers, a quarterback who could run and pass. Today he is gone at the age of 36. McNair and a woman were found dead inside a Nashville, Tennessee, condominium. McNair died from a gunshot wound to the head. The woman's name has not yet been released by authorities and no suspects are currently in custody. Now, McNair played, played 13 years in the NFL, mostly in Tennessee, but played the final two years with the Ravens in Baltimore before retiring in April of 2008. Now, McNair's former owner in Tennessee, Bud Adams, said this today, quote, he was one of the finest players to play for our organization and one of the most beloved players by our fans. Certainly more details to come in time concerning the story. Tom. When police officers arrived in response to that call, they found two individuals who had been shot to death inside the residence, one female, one male. We now know that the male deceased is Steve McNair. Police say the woman was not McNair's wife, Michelle. The scene of the shooting is within view of Titan Stadium, where McNair played most of his 13 seasons in the NFL. A police spokeswoman said that McNair was known to visit the condominium area, but didn't know if he was an owner. In fact, not much was known about the double killings early in the investigation. It's going to take uh, many hours to process the scene. Uh, I don't have any answers for you now as to what's happened, who's responsible what the circumstances are. McNair began his career in 1995 with the Houston Oilers, who eventually became the Titans. He was a double threat who could hurt opponents with his running as much as his passing. The three-time Pro Bowl quarterback had Tennessee within a yard of forcing overtime in the 2000 Super Bowl that they lost to St. Louis. McNair was so banged up at the end of the 2002 season he couldn't practice, but he guided the Titans to wins in the final five games, leading them to the AFC Championship game for the second time in four seasons. McNair threw for over 31,000 yards and 174 touchdowns in his career. He retired after the 2008 season. Since the day of Steve McNair's murder, there have been dozens of unanswered questions. What was it that motivated his young lover, Sahel Kazemi, to kill him? Was the former Titan dating more than one woman? And what exactly did happen on July 4th, the day their bodies were found? Tonight, a newly released timeline gives us a much clearer picture of what happened, starting on on July 2nd, the day of Kazemi's much talked about DUI arrest. Investigators have discovered that while Kazemi sat in a metro jail cell, McNair went to the condo of 25 year old Lee Ignani, the other woman police say he was apparently seeing. Though he was at Ignani's condo the morning of July 3rd, these text messages from McNair's phone to Kazemi's reveal that they were communicating into the wee hours of the morning. At 2.03 a.m., she says, you love me? A minute later, he responds, I love you, baby. Kazemi then states, I'm going to have all of you soon, to which McNair responds, yes, you will. Several hours later, those text messages resumed with Kazemi sending out a distress call. Baby, I might have a breakdown. I'm so stressed. By 4 p.m. on July 3rd, Kazemi is asking McNair for $2,000, and he agrees to transfer funds into her account. At 1.15 a.m. July 4th, those text messages stop, with Kazemi stating the door to his condo is open. She was already waiting for him inside. 
one half hour later, detectives arrived to collect evidence. This sketch shows they tore apart the couch looking for bullets. And we now know two rounds hit McNair and apparently went through the wall to the condo next door. You see, police removed portions of the drywall. It was obvious as we looked around, police dusted much of the condominium for fingerprints. They especially focused with heavy dust on the doors to the back porch and to the garage. The upstairs seems untouched by police. There was men's clothing in the closet and rap music playing quietly on a radio in the bedroom. In general, the apartment is very nondescript. No personal photos with little to indicate who might live there. A rare personal touch was found in the kitchen. There was a pile of delivery menus and an envelope taped on the counter with a $20 bill tucked inside. Written on the front, the words, never broke. Now, as I looked around inside the condo, it was somewhat surprising that you found nothing to indicate that this was where Steve McNair, Titans star football quarterback, lived. No football, no helmets, no jersey. The only thing we found in one of the closets upstairs, several boxes of unopened Nike basketball shoes. But, Rory, other than that, absolutely nothing with regard to his Titan football career. And, Nick, any sign inside there that Kazumi stayed there with McNair? You know, keep in mind, Rory, we don't know exactly what law enforcement took from the scene as evidence, but today I didn't see any sign, clothing or otherwise, that a woman ever spent much time inside this condominium. Live in downtown Nashville, Nick Barris reporting, News Channel 5 HD. My name is Reggie Aiken, and I'm here to bring you some information and uh, an update on the Steve McNair, uh, Sahil Kasemi uh, case, which was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee back in July 4th, uh, 2009. As you know, the case was listed as a murder-suicide case, which is absolutely incorrect. Uh, what you are looking at here is a double homicide, and which I believe Steve McNair and Sahil Kasemi were both murdered. And the people involved here, the first person is John. He's involved here. And they're in that apartment that morning was S Steve Norfleet and his sister Crystal Norfleet. Now they're partying there, and you have to remember in the party when you're having a party and people are there. And there was another guy there named Mark. He was there also with them. Now there's items all around. There's items left on the table and, 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 and could be upstairs and downstairs. Now my question is this: Who cleaned up that apartment? after this incident. If you notice in the pictures, the place was pretty clean, right? Now I'm telling you, John instructed to clean this apartment. He instructed Steve Norfleet and his sister, Crystal Norfleet, to clean that apartment after the murders. And I'm telling you something, this is very important that the, the, the spokesman now, if you notice, was Don Aaron which I'm telling you now is a corrupt cop from the Nashville Police Department. That's right. Don Aaron is a corrupt police officer who is a liar. Okay? And I'm going to later soon show you how that I caught him in a lie and, and involved with a secret family to help him cover up his mistake that he made, which I caught him. It's a somber message made all the more so by the person who is delivering it. Each year, too many young people have taken their own lives. That's Steve McNair, the former MVP quarterback who was killed by his mistress in a murder-suicide earlier this year. However, sometime before that, he made three versions of this public service announcement for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities. Hi, I'm Steve McNair. I know that some young people are struggling with tough times. Each year, too many young people are taking their own lives. Police say McNair was killed by this woman, who they say shot him three times as he slept here. The sports police in Nashville say the death of a former pro football quarterback, Steve McNair, was a homicide. The death of a former pro football quarterback, Steve McNair, was a homicide. Was a homicide. 
McNair and his girlfriend were found shot to death in an apartment McNair co-owned with a friend. Police are trying to determine if the shootings were a murder-suicide. McNair was shot four times. His girlfriend was shot once. McNair was shot four times. His girlfriend was shot once. Family of Sahil Kazimi gathered at her parents' Orange Park home Sunday. It is where Kazimi had lived until four years ago when she moved to Tennessee to be on her own. Kazimi's sister, Sapid Salmani, tells First Coast News her sister and Steve McNair were dating for four months. She says they were planning to move in together. She was happy with them. I'm not sure. She said that he was about getting divorced very soon, about two weeks ago. And they were going to move in together. Salmani says the two met when Kazimi was a waitress at a Dave and Buster's and McNair was a customer. She says she has no idea what led up to the shooting, but says her sister would never hurt herself or anyone else. She was very young, very pretty, very loving. She would never hurt a person. Outgoing. Very independent, very strong. Salmani says her brother flew to Tennessee. She stayed in Orange Park to help her parents deal with the tragedy. I was supposed to stay here and take care of the family, especially my mom and my dad. And he's supposed to be there and take care of the business. Um, was Adrian Gilliam a suspect in this case? And if so, why was he eliminated? I, I think early on, when you, anytime you have an investigation like this, you look at many potential suspects, uh, he being one of them. I think it'd be uh, ridiculous not to look at him initially on, uh, as well as many other people connected to, uh, to the people involved. And, and he was one of the persons we looked at, yes. And why was he eliminated as a suspect? What was the thing? Well, he was eliminated based on our investigation. Our investigation determined clearly that we were looking at a murder-suicide, not a double homicide made to look like a murder-suicide. It would be very difficult to uh, emulate something like that if you didn't know what you were doing. Double homicide made to look like a murder-suicide. It would be very difficult to uh, emulate something like that if you didn't know what you were doing. After nearly four days of intensive investigation. After nearly four days of intensive investigation. Nearly four days of intensive investigation. That includes laboratory test results and other investigative methods. The police department department has concluded that Steve McNair was murdered by Sahil Kazimi and that in turn Sahil Kazimi killed herself with a single gunshot wound to her head. While we may never know exactly what drove Ms. Kazimi to make that decision on that Saturday morning, the totality of the evidence clearly points to a murder-suicide. Based upon the appearance of the crime scene, evidence collected, autopsy findings, laboratory results, and an, an incredible amount of work by our investigative team. There's no doubt, uh, we believe now at this time, that McNair was seated on the sofa and likely was asleep. And we believe that Kazemi shot him in the right temple, then shot him twice in the chest, and then shot him a final time in the left temple. Kazemi shot him in the right temple, then shot him twice in the chest, and then shot him a final time in the left temple. To reconstruct the scene, basically, through ballistic science and trajectory of the, uh, of the rounds and whatnot, it was pretty clear to us that she was seated in a particular location when she fired the shot that killed herself and when she slid down on uh, Steve McNair's lap. All of that was consistent with the evidence. So nothing to suggest there was a third person in there who may have shot the two of them and then stayed so to look like a, a double homicide. Did we think initially that it could be a double homicide? Certainly we did. But once we got into it, we were able to determine that's not what it was. It was actually a murder suicide. Are there other persons who had interest in Miss Kasimi? Absolutely, there was. Uh, persons that were maybe jealous. I mean, some of that is possible, of course, but nothing along the lines of going to go in there, kill the two people, and oh, by the way, let's make it look like a murder suicide. Very difficult to do, and we don't believe that happened. As far as the science is concerned, he had no fingerprints on the gun. There's no gunshot residue on her hands. There is nothing literally that ties her to the murder weapon other than what you found at the crime scene. What was it at the crime scene that tipped it? Right, I would say uh, that's incorrect about no gunshot residue. Her left hand did reflect some uh, gunshot residue, uh, although there was not enough for to conclusively say that. The TBI did. Uh, although there was not enough for Kip to conclusively say that. The TBI did. She then positioned herself next to McNair on the sofa and shot herself once in the right temple and expired. Today we received preliminary information from the TBI that the five shell casings recovered matched the weapon that was pur purchased by Kazemi last Thursday, that the five bullets have been recovered and they too were all fired by the barrel of that weapon. 
Gunshot residue evidence, trace evidence was found on Kazemi's left hand, not enough for a conclusive result. And there was no gunshot wound, uh, gunshot residue evidence on Mr. McNair's hands. Over the last five to seven days of Kazemi's life, our investigation is learning that she had become very distraught and on two occasions told friends and associates that her life was all messed up and that she was going to end it all. Ms. Kazemi uh, had a vehicle that she owned. While the Escalade was purchased, we think with Mr. McNair, we believe she was paying payments on the Escalade. She was paying payments on a Kia, and her roommate was about to leave, which was going to effectively double her room, uh, her mortgage, her rent payment, I should say. We also have reason to believe that Kazemi recently learned before this day that she believed McNair was involved with another woman. The, originally, it was a verbal estimate by the TBI that there was right. gunshot residue on her left hand, but in the police summary, finally, that right. it was inconclusive that there was gunshot and, residue. And that's the language that they use, inconclusive, but if you speak with the forensic scientists who did the examination, they'll tell you that there was evidence of gunshot residue on Ms. Kasimi's left hand. How do you explain the relationship between Adrian Gillian Jr. and Ms. Kasimi? I've changed very differently from this happenstance casual relationship to 200 plus cell phone text right. messages, 49 text oh, I, 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 messages. Oh, I, I get all that. that no, no, nothing you're saying is, escapes me. I understand, understand everything you're saying. But none of it has anything to do with the actual event that occurred. Was um, Mr. Gilliam trying to have a relationship with Mr. Kasim? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that. But was he the one that went in there and killed the two and then made it look like a murder-suicide? No. Right here on News 5 is now drawing national attention. Right, and now Kings Island is ripping out part of its Halloween haunt even before it opened. And News 5's Karen Johnson live with the outrage from the tri-state all the way down to Tennessee. Hi, Karen. Well, Todd, we were the first and only station to give you a sneak peek inside this year's holiday, Halloween haunt. But some of you weren't happy with some of the images from inside the park. And now Kings Island has taken down the display and is apologizing. It was intended to be a celebrity graveyard thrill. Stars like Michael Jackson in his PJs, Farrah Fawcett wearing her red tank, and Heath Ledger with pill vials, all rising from the dead. Now the display itself is dead. And the pills, it just is showing you drug abuse. And if you have little kids, you don't want to be really, uh, you know, aware that, oh, they're celebrating this guy who died of drugs. Yeah, it's people having fun with Halloween, so I think, you know. I really don't have a problem with that. Earlier this week, Kings Island told me it was all in fun. The park meant no harm by the dead celebrities. Every year we try to raise the bar with what we're doing here and just make it a lot more intense, a lot scarier, you know, a lot more mortifying than the year before. But some folks, especially those from Nashville, were a little too mortified by the display. Particularly this exhibit, which showed murdered Tennessee Titans Steve McNair and his girlfriend. They were sitting on a couch. She was in lingerie. He was wearing a number nine jersey. A gun was at their feet. I could understand a tombstone, like, as a little just tribute, but dressing them is, I think it's a little much. Federal and local authorities working on the Steve McNair case have arrested a convicted murderer for allegedly providing the gun used to kill the former NFL quarterback. Police say Adrian Gilliam has confessed to selling a 9mm handgun to Sahil Kazimi just days before she shot McNair and then turned the gun on herself. Mr. Gilliam gave some information to the agents, and after uh, speaking with him, they did an intensive investigation of his background and determined that he had been convicted of attempted armed robbery and second-degree murder in the state of Florida. Police say the gun, like this one here, was first sold at a pawn shop back in 2002. They say Gilliam then broke the law both when he bought it a year and a half ago and when he sold it to Kazimi on July 2nd. A convicted felon cannot receive it, possess it, buy it, store it, hold it, shoot it, aim it, clean it, can't do anything with it. Authorities say he's not otherwise linked to the murder-suicide, but they add it is likely he'll be the only one to face any charges related to the murder of the former NFL MVP. There's going to be a measure of justice in this case, and it's going to, that involves this tragedy, and that measure of justice is going to be that the convicted felon who supplied the gun to Ms. Cassini is going to face justice. 
Authorities say if convicted, Gilliam could be sentenced to up to 10 years in prison. I spoke to the, to the gentleman, Tony, who right. was her boss, right. who saw her that oh, Friday night at I'm 10 o'clock, still... who said that she wasn't upset, she wasn't angry, she wasn't out of control. In fact, she was exactly the opposite. Um, she was sad about the fact that her roommate had left, right. but that was it. It wasn't right. that she was angry or emotionally distraught or irrational. I, I, and, and I get that. We've also spoke to witnesses who have told us the exact opposite. So, so, as far as his cell phone records are concerned, right. he spoke to her at 12.02 a.m. Correct. For three minutes. Right. Were you able to determine the substance of that call? No, he was probably 18 miles away from the scene when he had that conversation. Uh, probably the same, I think he sent her a text message, 1.25 a.m. or somewhere in that range on July the 4th. In addition to follow-up text messages later in the day on the 4th, um, probably 1.30 or so and then maybe later that night, and he was always never in the downtown area, absolutely never in the downtown area, which would be typical if you're going to ping off a tower where the scene of the crime occurred. Closest he was, probably 15 miles away. At the time of the suspected murder, he was uh, we still looking at 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning? Right, approximately, yes. So at about 1.30 on this text message on July right. 4th, right. Um, according to the cell phone towers and right. pings, He's uh, about 18 miles. Right, he's in the Laverne Smyrna area. That's that's where the area he was in, where he was pinging off of. Where he was basically most of that night. I think I was just so, I felt just um, abandoned. I felt angry. I felt, I don't think I even felt anger at first, though. Anger wasn't there. Anger came later, but I think it was just... I was hurt. I felt alone. I wanted answers. I just, how? What? You know, like, it was, it was too much. And then, like, all the particulars that went along, it was just so much. It was, it was, it was overbearing. It was overwhelming. That's what it was. It was overwhelming. Like, she started crying, and I knew that once she started crying, that it was kind of like the end. I just didn't know how to react. Like, I'd had both my parents my whole life, and like, I'd never experienced death before. And so I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna live. The family of Tennessee Titan great Steve McNair is suing. That's right. His widow and two children say a television crew trespassed and invaded their privacy. And as Nick Barris tells us, the family says they were then subjected to painful questions about the murder of the quarterback. The McNairs filed this lawsuit here in civil court alleging reckless and malicious conduct. And they say what was done was highly offensive. The lawsuit states that a crew from Crime Watch Daily, a syndicated program produced in Los Angeles, visited the McNair home back in August. This is a lawsuit for damages. It's a tort lawsuit uh, where the plaintiffs are seeking to recover for trespass and invasion of privacy, uh, an intentional infliction of emotional distress. With cameras rolling at the front door, McNair's widow says the crew started asking intrusive questions of her regarding the death of her husband, Stephen McNair, and were persistent in attempting to bait Michelle McNair into discussing painful details of her husband's death in the presence of her minor children. Steve McNair, the former Titans great, was shot and killed by an alleged girlfriend, 20-year-old Sahil Kazimi, back in 2009. Metro police say it was a murder-suicide, but at the time, Vincent Hill, a private investigator, claimed someone else was involved. He even wrote a book. There's still hundreds of unanswered questions. Back in 2010, Metro detectives debunked his theories. But I can tell you, most of that speculation in you went was coming from Vincent Hill. But Hill was with Crime Watch at the McNair home. He also is named in the lawsuit. Michelle McNair claims the crew refused to leave and maliciously suggested she was concealing the truth about the death of her husband and her children had to endure the painful, untrue, and unwarranted verbal assaults regarding the death. Metro police say the murder case is long closed. The McNair's lawyer says the family just wants such hurtful questions and unwelcome visits to stop. Perhaps most important, the McNairs are asking the court to issue a permanent injunction banning the use of any of that video shot that day. In Nashville, Nick Barris, News Channel 5.
And we did reach out to Vincent Hill by phone today. He says the visit to the McNair home lasted just a few moments. They never went inside, and the questions were not malicious. We did not hear back from Crime Watch Daily. He says neither he nor his older brother, Steve McNair Jr., was invited to their father's Jersey retirement in Nashville. He says they are being shunned from his legacy. This is a story you'll only see here on 12 News. Gerald Harris reports. What's your father's name? Steve McMahon. What's your name? Stephen McMahon. The Tennessee Titans retired to Jersey Sunday, number 27 for running back Eddie George, and number 9 for the late Steve McNair. McNair starred for the Titans following a stellar career at Alcorn State University. Sadly, he was murdered on July 4th, 2009. Honoring my father um, for the hero that he was, for the incredible athlete that he, that he was. But with the pomp and circumstance and overall emotion of the moment, two key figures in the life of Steve McNair were missing. What we expected, we made all kind of preparations to be there, you know, um, my brother has a family, you know, so it takes time to actually get everything together just to realize that, you know, hey, we never received a phone call, we never received an invite. Stevens family reached out to the Titans organization. They said McNair's widow was in charge of the invitations. Michelle McNair said details were being worked out long before the ceremony. On the title page, in my contact information, she reached out to me over a month and a half ago. According to the family of Stephen, it wasn't until 9, 12 a.m. Sunday morning, hours before kickoff, until Michelle McNair responded to Stephen's request to be present for the moment. She says that's BS. There's no way that I'm not going to invite you to something that they gave me to follow up. The Michelle McNair has she reached out a few times, including today, to secure a way for Stephen to join in. But he says he and his brother have been shut out of the lives of their younger brothers and cut off from their father's legacy. Never have I heard a, how are you, you know, how school, um, your brothers would love to see you, let's just have lunch, sit down, never received any of that. Little Steven, as his family calls him, says it's time now to speak out for him and his older brother. What, what do we do, you know, what, 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 what have we done in, in, in such hurt that you feel like you just have to place us aside, like that we don't matter, our opinions don't matter, that you don't even have the, the, the decency to even check up on us to see how we're doing. While his younger brothers, his father's brothers, and family stood in the moment as McNair's number nine legacy was placed into the history books, Lil Steven stood watching wearing his father's jersey 400 miles away. Um, it was really emotional that I wasn't there, but, you know, things have to continue on, things have to go on. Um, I wish I was there, but, um, you know, time being, maybe, maybe in the future. In the spring 1995, I left Houston go down to Alcorn State University to witness a workout of an up and coming very talented young quarterback with part of our part of our staff. We got there, his mom Lucille had food for everybody. We spent the day with him on and off the field in the classroom and as we got in the car to head back to Houston, we were unanimous as a staff. We're unanimous that this young man was special. He was special and he's going to be special. So here we are, 15 years later, and he's no longer with us. As I sat in my office moments ago pondering what to say, it occurred to me. What Steve McNair, you knew, would want you to say. The Steve that I knew, if you were here right now, would want me to say, Michelle, I love you. Tyler, Trent, Stephen, Junior, I love you. That's what he would want me to say. Steve that I knew. Lucille, Fred, everybody, love you. Steve McNair that, that I knew, you want me to say, I'm sorry. Perfect. We all make 
decisions sometimes in my best interest. Please forgive me. The Steve McNair that I knew want me to say celebrate my life. Play action. Oh my. McNair looking deep. Cuts up the middle. He can run. 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Dive to the one yard line. will miss him as you all will miss him. And I ask you to honor what he did on the field and in the community. What he was is a tremendous